thank you for watching my channel today. My name's Sarah and my channel is called Your True Shelf. Today I'm doing a Friday Reads again and I'm going to tell you about the books that I read in the past week as well as the books that I'm reading now and the books that came into my TBR in the last week. So first I'm going to go through the books that I finished. So the first book I finished was a book I was planning to read this month for sure because it was my work book club book and it's actually was actually my choice as well. So I finished Crossing to Safety by Wallace Stegner, which was written in the early 80s. And this is a book that I bought quite a while ago. I picked it up in Waterstones because I fancied reading some more. I was just in the mood for some more modern classics. But then I reckon I bought it like a good two years ago and I've only just picked it up. And I'm really glad that I did because it was a really good book. So we're following two couples. There's Sally and Larry are one couple and Sid and Charity are another couple and it's set in late 1930s in the west of USA. So both of the men are trying to get professorship or tenure at the local university. The couples meet each other and become firm friends. Sally, Sally and Larry are quite hard up and Charity and Sid are very wealthy and Charity and Sid kind of help um Sally and Larry out quite a lot with their um opportunities and places to stay and things like that and it just follows them over their lifelong friendship and the things that they both the families go through in that time period so when we start off they're both um becoming parents for the first time and there's we go in quite a lot of detail about those first sort of few years of their friendship and at the beginning of the book, they've come back together. It would seem after a bit of a break from each other and it would seem that um, Charity is really ill and that's why they've come back together. And so we sort of occasionally we dip into the present, which is when they're in their 60s, I would say. And then we go back into the past again and sort of see how they led up to the point that they're at now. And it's a really, oh, the writing is absolutely gorgeous. I really loved his writing style. There's a few things which were of the time, um, mainly around how the women basically like waited on the men quite a lot. Um, like the men would never have been like cooking or doing anything with the kids or anything like that. The men's careers were sort of valued more than the women's careers as well. I know that's of its time, but... It didn't detract from the story for me. It just made me kind of raise an eyebrow a few times. Um, but the writing style was absolutely gorgeous. And I'm really curious to read more by Wallace Stegner now because, yeah, Wallace Stegner's won the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award. And I would really like to read more of his work. So that was a really good start. That was a 4.5 star book for me. Then I had a, a five star book on Audible which is one that I read for the Women's Prize for Nonfiction and very sadly it didn't make the long the short list, it stayed on the long list and that was Matrescence by Lucy Jones. This was wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, it's part memoir about Lucy Jones' experience of becoming pregnant for the first time, her pregnancy, her birth and what she found life was like once she'd become a mother, which is what Matrescence is. And part of it as well is about the science that she references quite a lot of scientific um, literature and things not in a dry way I hasten to add um, which sort of backs up claims or which tells us about latest developments in science or lack of research or you know statistics about birth postnatal depression like lots of different topics which she covers and um, it, the wonderful thing about this book was that it was very real and she kind of covers things like, you know, how it can feel not very nice being pregnant and she talks in depth about birth and the the difficulties that she had with her birth and lots of what she was saying was very, like, resonated a lot with me and, and my experience and... The thing that I think resonated the most was she really talks about what it's like when you have a baby and when you're trying to care for another human, you're trying to raise children and everyone's just saying, like, everyone's focusing on the baby and congratulations and isn't this wonderful and this is the best time of your life and she really didn't feel that way. She really struggled with, she struggled with postnatal depression, she had um, extreme sleep deprivation, she had anxiety through the roof. She had lots of difficulties with breastfeeding 
she had some very traumatic sort of flashbacks of her birth. She was really struggling and she sort of talked a lot about how in this country we're not set up for that and how in other cultures it's very much like a group effort to at the start of a child's life especially and looking after mum and how in other cultures you might get sisters or mums or mother-in-laws moving in for a while to help care for mum or help sort of the house to run while mum's recovering from birth and and learning how to do everything and extremely sleep deprived and things like that which was also really interesting because I did find those especially first couple of months of motherhood like really really difficult and I could again relate to quite a lot of what she was saying and it really made me sort of think um, not only about my experience but about people I know who've had babies recently or about um, my work especially because I do as part of my job I do the baby checks which happen when the babies are between six to eight weeks old and I think I am quite good at focusing on the mum as well as the baby it certainly for me isn't just a check for the baby it's definitely a check for mum but I remember when I had my own postnatal check it was very like this is a tick box exercise and I wouldn't have shared any difficulties with the doctor that I saw because she didn't make me feel that I could and I don't think that I do them in that way but I, it just kind of really reinforces every opportunity where you have contact with a new mum is that their chance to tell you if they're really struggling and to make sure that you give them a good chance to do that. Um, so I found this book, it was like just brilliant. She says she thinks that the more you know before you have a baby, the better. I don't know if I'd recommend this book to somebody who was about to go through this because I think it might scare the wits out of them. <laughs> um, I think that whatever you read in preparation for having a baby, it's never anything like what actually happens. Whatever you think you know, I think you can't prepare unless, until you're doing it. And I don't know whether I'd recommend this for somebody. Like, one of my friends once said to me, like, birth stories are to be shared, not told. And I sort of think, yes, I agree with that because I wouldn't go and tell somebody who was pregnant all the gory details about birth because I don't think it's fair. And yet Lucy's kind of saying if everyone went in armed with the facts, they could make more of decisions about whether they wanted, like, an elective section, for instance. But that's a whole other debate. Um, but this book I just thought was wonderful and she really said things that I haven't probably heard people say before and I thought it was wonderful. So that was a five-star read for me. And the last book I finished was the book that I was reading with my kids and this also fits in with Middle Grade March and it was The Boy at the Back of the Class and I really terribly have forgotten the author's name but I will insert a picture of the cover which will have her name on it. And this is a book which I recognise the cover, um, it's got quite a memorable cover I think and it's actually touring as a play at the moment and I'm taking my eldest to go and see it at the theatre next month. So we got the book out from the library and it's about a refugee called Ahmet who comes from Syria. So one day one of the pupils has left uh, this class and Ahmet appears in the student's place. He sits at the back of the class on his own. He is quite shy. He doesn't really make eye contact with any of the other children. And there's a group of four children who, one of whom narrates the book, who really want to befriend Ahmet. And they really go to um, as many lengths as possible to make him feel as welcome and accepted in the class as they can. And we gradually learn Ahmet's story about where his parents are, how he ended up coming to the UK and why. And it's really aimed at children understanding what might have happened to a refugee and the very terrible journeys they've had to come to whichever country they're coming to and what might have happened to them on the way. And in this particular case, Arma has been separated from his family. So it's about the class trying to understand what that might be like. And it's also about the class doing some gra grassroots activism to try and stop families being separated and try and reunite Ahmet with his family. And they do come across some negativity from some adults about refugees, which is also explored tactfully and carefully in the book so that children understand, you know, that's not acceptable behaviour and some adults do this out of ignorance and fear and sort of tries to dispel the myths. And interestingly, at the end of the book, there were some facts and it says about that, despite what people think, 
Now, let me get this right. The main countries which take refugees, I think, were Sir Turkey, Ethiopia, and Greece, I think. And the total number of refugees that are taken in by those three countries are more than the, refu the total number of refugees taken in by the rest of the whole of Europe. So when we see these kind of scaremongering figures and things on the, on the news, we take in a tiny fraction of refugees compared to other countries, really tiny, and it was a very small percentage of the world's refugees come to the UK. And it just kind of really put it into perspective when people or you know some people are really unwelcoming and, and negative and I do think that this is a great book to introduce children to other people's stories and what might have happened to other children who are the same age as them to build welcoming anti-racist roots for them as they get older and for adults things like the beekeeper of Aleppo that I read earlier this year I just don't see how anybody could read either of those books and not be welcoming to refugees so I think it's really important. Everyone really enjoyed it. And um, I'm really looking forward to seeing the play in next month as well. So they are the three books that I finished. Currently, I am reading... So the next book that I picked up last night is this one. This is The Descendants by Carrie Hart Hemmings. And this was made into a film in 2012, I believe, with George Clooney. And I saw it at the cinema and really enjoyed it. The reason I'm reading this book now, it's been on my TBR for quite some time. I'm using it for my TBR spin book and also for my Ben Reads Good reading challenge. So Ben's prompt was to read something along the lines of reading a book which has won an Oscar for a best ad adaptation, which this did. And for my TBR spin, it was the challenge was something like read a book to soothe your soul or something like that. And that could be for any reason. And the reason I am doing this for both was because I thought it would decrease my stress because I had quite a busy reading month in March. It would decrease my stress if I was reading one book that covered both prompts. So this was a soothing book for that reason. And it's the Oscar adaptation book for Ben's challenge as well. So all I know about this so far is that this guy, who's played by George Clooney in the film, his wife is in a coma after having a speedboat accident he's got two daughters who he's never really been involved in their lives that much until this time even though he's he's together with their mum who they, he just has been busy working and stuff so he's now trying to parent two daughters that he doesn't really know very well and there's also so he's been um he's been in hawaii his family i think for two generations but his great grandfather came into masses of land in Hawaii through ill gotten gains, basically through colonialism. And it's now come to the point where him and his cousins are planning on selling off this land. And obviously, that's kind of really pissing off the local people because they don't want it to be developed by developers who are just in it to make money. So he's trying to decide what to do with this land. And that's where we're at. So I'm only like. 40 pages in at the moment but I'm really enjoying it then I'm also for my audio choice um I wanted a break from the women's prize non-fiction uh, non list for a bit so I chose my oldest audio book again so that's the third time that I've done this now and I've chose gut by Julia Enders which is a non-fiction book about the gut and gut health is something that I find really interesting and I'd really like to learn more about. I think it's probably going to be something which drives medicine in the future and it's a very new, like the microbiome and stuff is a very sort of on topic thing at the moment and I really think that's going to be where a lot of the future answers lie in, in lots of diseases but I really want to learn more about it. So far, I'm about a third of the way into this book, which I started yesterday, I think. Um, I would say that some things are good revision for me. Some things, like little kind of trivia and facts, I didn't know. But it's very much for the complete beginner, I would say. And so... So far, I'm finding it interesting, but it's not really what I thought it was going to be at the moment. So it's still giving me new information. And like I said, there's bits in there that I think, oh, okay, I didn't know that. 
but I don't think it's going to give me the in-depth kind of knowledge necessarily that I wanted. Maybe that was never going to happen because it's written for lay people, I believe. But anyway, so it's, I'm still enjoying it, but I think it's probably not quite what I expected. So that's what I'm listening to. And then I'll just briefly tell you about the books that I bought. So I recently went into Waterstones to choose myself something for Mother's Day because I am quite hard to buy for with books, I think, because Sam doesn't really know what I've got, what I've read, necessarily what I'd like. So I think it's a bit intimidating to go and buy me a present from a bookshop. So this is what I chose. So the first thing I chose was one of the Women's Prize books, which was this one. Um, a Trace of Sun by Pam Williams. I was a little bit surprised I chose this because this wasn't one of the ones that I was really excited about on the long list. But they had a couple of books, still no display for the Women's Prize, which I'm really disappointed about. They had a couple on the paperback tables. And when I started flicking through this, it instantly kind of grabbed me. And so I thought, OK, I want to buy this one. So this is about Rafe, who's left behind in Grenada when his mother, Scylla, follows her husband to England in search of a better life. When they're finally reunited seven years later, they're strangers and the emotional impact of the separation leads to events that rip their family apart. As they try to move forward with their lives, his mother's secret will make Rafe question all he's ever known of who he is. And it's inspired in part by the author's own family experiences, which is interesting because that was the same for Restless Dolly Maunder and I didn't realise that about this one. The second one I read was the second in a series, so which is It's Not Summer Without You by Jenny Han. So this is the, the first one's called The Summer I Turned Pretty and this was a Netflix adaptation that I really loved and I was watching it last summer. I bought the first book in Cornwall and read it in Cornwall last year and I wanted to get the second one um, for our holiday where we go. We go to Cornwall every year and we're going to Cornwall again in the summer. So I will save this for them. They've got these really nice spines. The other one's kind of like a coral colour. Um, I wanted to get the matching covers. So this one is now out. This is the... Oh, it's not on Netflix. So it's Prime. This is a Prime TV tie-in. But it's basically like a YA romance. Easy to read, but fun. And I just love the TV series. The third book I got for Mother's Day was a classic that I've wanted to read for absolutely ages and um, I'm going to buddy read it with Joe in April so it's going to be off my TBR very quickly and this is Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin so I've wanted to read James Baldwin for so long and I finally bought this book and I'm sure that if I enjoy it I'll go on to read all his other works. This is quite a slim book, it's only about 120 pages I think, 160 pages and I know it's about a guy who's kind of um, fighting against being queer and and trying to be with women and not men, even though that's not what he wants. So looking forward to that. And then the final book I bought, I got secondhand from Vinted. And it is a book that I saw Louise Savage talk about. It was her book of the month last month. And it is The Incarnations by Susan Barker. So this is one that really interests me because this is about reincarnation, I believe. It's got a quote on the front that says, reads as China's Midnight Children, which I loved Midnight, Midnight's Children. And it says, I dream of us across the centuries. I think from what Louise said, it's about a taxi driver in China who keeps receiving letters telling him about his past lives or something like that. I don't really want to know more than that, but anything to do with past lives is like a real kind of um, tick box for me that I love that. So this is, yeah, it's really beautiful as well. This is one that I'm excited to read and I bought it on Louise's recommendation. So that's all of the books that are kind of past, present and future for me at the moment. And um, I'd love to hear the same for you, like if you've bought any new books in the last week or what you're reading at the moment and how you're getting on with the Women's Prize, if that's what you're doing. And um, I hope you have a really lovely Easter Bank holiday weekend and I will speak to you all soon. Bye.